Hi, can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, how to get started with WebGL and three, basically by using 3.js. I don't know if you're familiar with that library, um, but I'm going to go from the beginning into creating something that should look something like this. If, like, hopefully, we should get something like this running. So hopefully, that's what we're going to get. So um, uh, first, um, you can find me on Twitter or on my website um, for anything that you might ask or need some help with. I'm always there to help people. Um, a bit about, um, about myself. I work for a production company that's called Be Real. We've done several online experiences that have been pretty um, famous, like the Wilderness Downtown, back in the HTML5 um, first um, eclosion, uh, the Google Maps Cube game, which is one of the first proper WebGL uh, games, The Bravest Man, another kind of music clip with CSS, and more recently, the Gravity website for, for the movie, Gravity. Um, I'm not going to be talking about any of these projects. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my personal, personal experiments, which are um, about um, what's the newest technology, how can it be done, uh, how, what problems do we have, uh, how to explore new drafts of new APIs, everything that lands on Canary or on Nightly. Um, just explore stuff. Um, the things we do in our underwear at 3 a.m. on our computer, and it's not that what you're thinking. <laughs> So, um, WebGL, um, there's, been, there's been a lot of uh, ways of putting 3D content on the web. Um, there was a lot of from, from Flash, there was a lot of through different um, uh, plugins. Uh, there was, of course, a need for something uh, native, something that didn't need uh, a plugin. So we got WebGL. WebGL, as the Wikipedia says, it's a JavaScript API for rendering interactive 3D graphics and 2D graphics within any compatible web browser without the use of plugins. Pretty straightforward. Um, so the solution everyone uh, agreed upon was uh, extending the, to the Canvas context, the Canvas uh, HTML5 element, um, and create, uh, expose an API to OpenGL ES, which is, is not your desktop, it's not your big machine uh, OpenGL implementation, but the one that runs on mobile devices or, or smaller devices. Um, for good or for worse, that's what we have. There's some things that we cannot do yet. There's some things that we can do. So, it's for the moment, it's it's a good it's a good thing to to use. The problem is that WebGL it's a very raw API. I mean, if you've used OpenGL, it's basically moving buffers around. The OpenGL machine it's implemented as a state machine, so you have to be constantly telling exactly what it has to do. Uh, like, give me a buffer so I can give you my vertices, then copy these vertices. Okay, I'm done. Now the normals, now materials. So, a pretty simple, a very, a very simple example, it just turns into a long, long uh, piece of code. So, there's 3.js, 3.js, um, which is um, a project started by Ricardo Cabello. Um, and basically from, from, the, from the GitHub page, it says the aim of the project is to create a lightweight 3D library with a very low level of complexity, in other words, for dummies. It doesn't have to fe feel like an insult, it's basically so anyone that likes to be creative, that has some kind of, of creative um, source or, 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 or need, can use it, can harvest uh, all the power of the modern browsers without having to actually know um, everything about 3D graphics. So it's kind of a higher level API, very simple. Uh, it removes almost all complexity from dealing for, with WebGL. It's also, it tries to be um, renderer agnostic, so the same code technically runs on, regardless on the rendering backend that you choose, so the same code could run on Canvas, on SVG, on CS3D, and WebGL. It's not so because there's something that you can do with only one of these technologies, but more or less with a bit of work, it's, it can be done. You can reuse part of your code and do a fallback with CSS3D if there's no WebGL available on your platform. 
So, this is a warning for uh, a couple of reasons. Um, I'm a bit reckless and I always like to do things um, that might turn out wrong. So, uh, I thought that it would be interesting to show a kind of live coding without actually live coding. So, I've created, for, for this purpose, for this specific uh, talk, this tool that basically will run through several steps on creating the demo you've seen. So, let's see if it works. Let's see if it's, um, if I can keep up with my, with my own coding. So, that's your classic script tag. You would have that on a web page, on a web project. So, what I'm gonna be showing is straightforward JavaScript. No dependencies, no, no precompilers, no anything. So, first thing, what you're gonna do? We're gonna create, uh, we're gonna start everything. So what you usually do, I advise to use the strict mode so everything can be kept under control and get our code ready for when the page has loaded. That's pretty simple. So the first thing we need, it's a renderer. Uh, the renderer would be the object that will hold the state of our WebGL um, context. And then we could, would be able to address directions and tell the renderer to do things. So we first uh, include the 3.js library, and our, on our init, we create this renderer. In this case, it's a WebGL renderer. As I said, it could be Canvas renderer or SVG renderer. We have to, say, to set a size for the renderer, and usually you have to change the size on every on Windows resize events, so it keeps with the, with the size of your window. And the renderer has a DOM element inside, which is the actual canvas that is gonna display our rendering uh, um, elements, and you just attach it to your, to your window, to your document. So now it's there. We still don't see it because there's actually nothing, and by default, usually uh, canvas in WebGL are transparent. So the next thing that we have to do after we've initialized everything is to set a render loop, which we will do by calling our render method. And there's this request an emission frame. I don't know if you're familiar with that, me that method. Okay, this, uh, in short, usually when you try to get some animation running, you use set timeout. Uh, set timeout is not really rel reliable. As you saw yesterday, because of the nature that the uh, task queue is processed, when you do a uh, set timeout, uh, it takes some time until it gets uh, actually processed. So if you want to run 60 frames per second, because which is the target, the ideal target for real-time graphics, you need something that keeps the beat uh, better. So this is why request animation frame, animation frame. It's, a, it's got a different, uh, a, a more ad, um, advantages, like uh, it won't be running if your tab is not on focus, so it won't be hogging resources on your, on your system, which is a good thing. So what it does basically is this sets uh, a 16, 16 millisecond timeout to call render again. So this is what we are doing. This is actually running again, but we're not drawing anything. So, next thing, we're gonna create a, a scene, a camera, uh, which is the basic element. So, a scene, it's the object that holds all the objects that we want to draw. It's, it basically abstracts a scene graph, that's where you're gonna put all your geometries, all your lights, your cameras, everything. And you can actually have several scenes, so you can turn from one scene to the other and create a scripted uh, environment. Uh, and the camera, there's uh, basically two types of cameras. One is with uh, perspective, and then you specify the field of view, which is in, in angles, in, in degrees, sorry. And the aspect ratio, which is the aspect ratio of our window, the far by the near clipping plane, so it's when are we gonna discard geometry when it's too close to our camera, and the far clip plane, which is when we are gonna discard it because it's too far away. Because we don't want to draw everything that there is on the scene. So a camera basically creates a volume that will only render what's inside it. So we, don't, we, cannot, we can discard the rest of our scene. We move the camera a bit, from, a bit away from the, from the origin. Everything that is created on 3.js or on any 3D package is created on the origin, which is the 3D coordinate 0, 0, 0. Objects, cameras, lights, and then you have to move them. If you remember yesterday talk about mat matrices, that's the translation step. So 3.js takes care of all this for us. It keeps all these 
position or rotation scale uh, factors keeps the matrices updated uh, without uh, telling us and does all the calculations. So we don't really have to worry about anything like that. So and we, and we add the renderer, 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 and we specify our scene and the camera we want to uh, render with that, uh, we want that scene to be rendered because usually you can have several cameras on the same scene, kind of like a, like a movie. And still, we're not seeing anything because we're missing something, which is uh, a geometry. We actually need a mesh. So, a mesh, it's um, another object that is con it holds a geometry and a material. So, a geometry, it's everything that defines the object that we want to, to create, that we want to show. In this case, I'm going to create an icosahedron geometry. 3JS got plenty of basic primitive uh, geometries, like cubes, like spheres. Uh, in this case, it's a it's, um, triangulated uh, sphere, which looks pretty nice. Um, but you can also load uh, a model, or you can generate it yourself. So, we create the, there we, there we have. So, we create a material. In this case, it's a mesh normal material, which means that we want our object to be shaded with, an, with their normals. We want to see how their normals look. A normal, it's, now I realize that you probably don't know what a normal is, but uh, it's a vector that defines the outer direction of each one of these triangles. So we can use that for, for light calculations. So we've created our material, which is a three mesh normal material. We've created our geometry, and then we create our mesh by specifying the geometry and the material that we want, and we add it to our scene. And that's it. We're then on the render loop, we're creating some simple animation, which is using the mesh uh, rotation y-axis to increment it, and then it rotates. It rotates in that. In the so, um, next thing that we would like to do, now that we have a, a, a mesh, we might like to animate it. So what we're gonna do is use Perlin noise. Perlin noise, it's a kind of noise function that it's not too random. It can be scaled, it can be used to produce very pleasant results. It's used everywhere in, in, in CG graphics. So we include this library and create a method that we're gonna call update blob, and we pass the geometry that we have. So what we do basically is for each vertex that we have in our geometry, we're gonna distort it in some way so we create a, a, an animation. In this case, um, what I'm gonna do is calculate um, distance that is gonna undulate, and you can see it here. For the Sorry. Okay, this is not stopping. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> stop. Okay, stop. Never mind. So, what we're doing is we're iterating through all the vertices in our geometry, taking that vertex, which is a, it's a 3D coordinate. We're calculating a noise uh, function and then displacing that vertex along its normal like this. So, for every vertex that we have, we can distort it and it creates this shape. Okay, so every time you modify a, a geometry on 3JS, um, usually you have to tell um, the backend, the WebGL renderer, that it's changed, so you have to tell it to recompute the vertex and the face normals, so you don't have to do it. You could do it, but it's a long task, and there's tools for that. And then you have to tell also that the vertices have, have been updated, other normals have been updated. So it will regenerate the buffers and upload them to the GPU again. And that's basically it. Uh, I've changed the geometry to a cube geometry because um, usually when you've got a cube, like in, on the left, and you normalize it, you get a, a, a cool sphere that's got actually less vertices than the regular sphere. So we're not consuming as many resources. And that's basically it. On our render loop, we are calling update blob, and we're changing the geometry. So that's what it's been doing. On the init, it changes the, the it creates the geometry, and on our render loop, we're uh, updating it by distorting it. This is not the best way of doing it, because you sh you're telling JavaScript to do it all by itself. It's usually better to let, it, uh, let the vertex shader do it, but f for the purpose of this talk, this is uh, pretty adequate. 
So I'm going to try to get into creating a shader, actually. Everything in this in 3JS are shaders. All the materials that you see are actually shaders, but you don't see it. You just instant instantiate those mesh normal materials. But um, behind behind the engine, it's it's everything. It's a shader. So you can define your own shaders. So a shader, it's usually something that it's a script coded in GLSL language. It's kind of a C-like um, language. Um, you can insert a script tag in your own code. Usually you should have some kind of loading system, so you can load um, uh, an external file. And all shaders have two parts. The vertex shader, which in this case I'm going to show you, what it's doing is taking the normal that we've calculated on our JavaScript, which is sent to the vertex shader, it's uh, making some normal calculations so you can place it on the wall. And then this GL position, it's the actual vertex that is going to be outputted by the vertex shader. It's what it's transformed. So when, the, when our position vertex comes to the vertex shader, it's not transformed, it's on the origin. And that matrix that is applied here, which is the model view matrix, is the one that moves, scale, rotates our vertex into the exact position. And the projection matrix is the one that turns it into, into a 2D image. The fragment shader basically takes uh, another value and outputs a color. So the fragment shader, it's the unit that defines how it's it's not a pixel, it's also sometimes called pixel shader, but that's not quite, because sometimes when you have multi-sampling, you're, you're rendering four pixels or eight pixels per fragment. Sorry, eight fragments per pixel. So it's usually referred as fragment shader. But you, you could think about it as pixels. So each pixel, each fragment on the screen, it gets calculated how it should be shaded, which color should have, and then that creates the rasterized image. And then, when we create it, instead of a mesh normal material, we create a shader material. And we have to specify a set of um, parameters, which are the universe, which are empty for now. The vertex shader, it's that first uh, script that we've used. We get it with document get element by ID and specify the text content. Same for the fragment shader, and we specify a shading, which in this case is smooth shading, which means that the, the, all the values will be interpolated. So, same thing we have, um, but now we are using our own materials, so we can actually do more things with, with, with our shaders. So we're going to try to get the next thing, which is now that we're drawing normals, we can try to do some lighting. And the lighting that we're going to try to do, it's based on these um, materials, which are called matcaps. I don't know if you're familiar with them. are used in applications like ZBrush or Modo. They use this these round textures as a spherical environment mapping and then you look up uh, on that texture and light your object with that. So you're not actually using any light, any equations, you're just looking up a texture. So what we're going to do, this varying parameter, it's something that's going to be shared between our vertex shader and our fragment shader. So the vertex shader is going to calculate this lookup value, pass it to the fragment shader, and the fragment shader will do the actual lookup. So what comes now, it's just some equation. It's something that you can find on textbooks. It's something that there's plenty of forms. You don't have to really understand it. It's awesome if you understand it, but that's not the point. All these equations are basically pretty much established. So lighting equations or ray tracing equations are, are there. You just use them. So in this case, what this is doing, it's um, assigning this Vn value and passing it to the, to the fragment shader. And the fragment shader will, will do its lookup a texture based on this value and output it. So now we have to tell the material that we have to, we have to provide a texture, which is going to be done like this. It's a uniform. It's called texture matcap. It's a type texture. And you will use three image utils load texture to load that uh, specific file. So there's a lot of um, util uh, in, there's a lot of um, different libraries, different utils into 3JS that allows us to do all this. You don't have to worry about loading textures, you don't have to worry about loading meshes, it just works. And 
yeah, that's basically it. I ran out of the 20 minutes, um, but um, basically uh, what I want you to understand is that it's not difficult. The part that really worries people about uh, 3JS or 3D graphics is all the equations, but these equations usually you just found them, try to understand them and use them. But for your first 10 projects, 3JS is more than capable of allowing you to do pretty cool stuff without actually having to, to know uh, 3D theory, 3D graphics programming. So that's it. Um, questions or, yeah, for the polygons. Some people have phobias. So yeah, let's talk. Thanks.